If your country is a member of the NATO Military Alliance, then your military most likely uses the M240 as its general purpose regular infantry machine gun. The reason for this is because in the event of a world war, it'd be a lot easier to figure out the logistics of supplying ground forces in the event that different NATO countries had to fight alongside one another. This way, it's cheaper to supply parts and ammunition for one type of gun. You only have to create and train on one common machine gun strategy. Fire superiority and support by fire are the two key tactics used by every M240 NATO machine gun team. I mean, it kind of seems like a no-brainer, right? But it's actually something of a small miracle that the US, UK, France, Canada, and Australia all agreed to use the same machine gun. Those are countries that normally can't even agree on what's acceptable to dip your fries into. Meanwhile, in NATO's counterpart, the so-called Alliance of Autocracies, Russia, China, North Korea, they all use the PKM to fill a very similar role in their infantry unit. Both the M240 and the PKM fire a similarly powerful 7.62 round, but the PKM actually looks better on paper. Since the 240 is actually five pounds heavier, $1,500 more expensive, and has a max range 200 meters shorter. It's only once you fully understand the tactics and doctrine of NATO forces do you start to see why the M240 is, in my opinion, a better weapon. In this video, we're going to examine NATO's M240 machine gun, its development history, the strategy and tactics used on the battlefield, and I want to introduce you to some common strategies of shooting used by NATO's machine gunners. Hopefully, by the end of the video, I'll be able to prove that NATO's doctrine, combined with this weapon, is currently the best military strategy out there. The development story behind the weapon traces its roots back to 1958, when Belgium designer Ernest Verbier set to work on creating a new machine gun for FN Herstal. The main concept of the FN Mag was that it would be incredibly reliable and needed less maintenance costs, but it would have the trade-off of being more expensive to manufacture and it weighed more than similar weapons in its category. It's important for us to understand the operating procedure. So the M240's operating mechanism is the standard open bolt gas operating system that you see in most belt-fed machine guns. By going with the open bolt, it makes the weapon less accurate, but it also allows it to reach higher rates of fire more reliably. When the operator squeezes the trigger, it sends the bolt assembly forward, which both chambers and fires a round, while also stripping the next round off the belt. Once the round is fired, the gas from the primer is sent down into the gas regulator. The return gas pushes against the operating rod, which pulls back the bolt, extracting the spread brass. The recoil spring then pushes the bolt forward, repeating the entire process over again. And this will go on until you let go of the trigger or get yelled at for melting the barrel. The original version weighed a whopping 27 pounds, and it was over four feet in length. It had a high rate of fire, capable of hitting between 650 and 800 rounds per minute, depending on the variant and the gas setting used. NATO fighting doctrine is actually largely based around leaning directly into the advantages of this weapon system. So for instance, they prefer to only advance when they have fire superiority because the FN mag is ideal for providing a high volume of fire and allows the operator to easily swap out barrels for sustained long-term shooting. That's where the advantage is. The FN mag was developed by Ernest Verbier to be a combination of two different World War II era weapons, the German MG42 and the American BAR. The trigger mechanism, quick change barrel, and spring-loaded dust cover were taken from the German MG42, while the receiver itself was essentially an inverted 1918 BAR designed to take a belt of ammunition instead of a magazine. At this time, it was called the FN Mag, and it quickly saw adoption in the late 50s and 60s by countries such as Belgium and the United Kingdom. But it was originally rejected by the American military in favor of the M60 machine gun, which fired the same cartridge. The type of machine gun that the American military chose to use is very important because it often sets the standard for what the other NATO countries will adopt. They're kind of like a military trendsetter, except in this case, they were late to the game to adopt the FN mag, and here's why. So the American military was actually originally only interested in the version of this M240 that could be vehicle mounted, so for tanks and light armor. The army had a competition to identify the best machine gun for its vehicles. During stress tests, they found that the FN mag blew the competition away. It fired more rounds before having any malfunctions or stoppages, and they could fire it almost four times as long before it would break. During these tests in 1977, inside declassified military documents about the tests, the US military actually had to consider how many FN mags that they could acquire because it was a foreign-made weapon at the time. 
and the Buy American Act, passed in 1933 by Congress, meant that the United States government was required by law to prefer U.S.-made products. This is probably why FN Herstal made a division of their company called FN America to produce the weapon in South Carolina inside the U.S. After these tests in 1977, the U.S. Army adopted the FN Mag specifically for use in tanks and they renamed it, giving it the weapon designation of M240. It took more than 10 years after that for the ground-pounding regular U.S. infantry to get their hands on the weapon. In 1991, the Marine Corps adopted the Gulf variant and by the late 1990s, the U.S. Army followed suit bunch of military copycats. The designation General Purpose given to the M240 meant that it was designed to fill multiple roles being used by tanks, helicopters, LAVs, and Husky privates from the Midwest. Each of those roles were given a different model that had higher rates of fire or heavier barrels depending on its purposes. NATO militaries usually have a designated squad or platoon that is responsible for the heavy M240 machine guns. The Alliance of the Autocracies, they treat their general purpose machine gun, the PKM, very differently. It's less of a crew-served weapon, so it's kind of an individual weapon that is used in any squad or any role. The main advantage to the PKM, though, is that it's much lighter at 16 pounds versus the M240 Lima, which weighs around 21 pounds. So you can see where their fighting doctrines both kind of complement the weapon system that they use. It's kind of built around these machine guns. But since it weighs more, the M240 machine gun teams, they have to practice a different style of tactics. NATO depends on fire superiority. They have to achieve fire superiority against the enemy in a firefight before even thinking about maneuvering any of their elements onto the enemy. I think this doctrine is part of the reason why NATO forces they take less casualties in war. In order to guarantee they're sending more rounds than the enemy, they use a strategy called talking the guns. This is when you have one MG team fire off a burst and then the other team fires off a burst directly afterwards and then you rinse and repeat. This conserves ammo and it prevents the barrels from overheating while still maintaining that overall high volume of fire because to the enemy it seems like the machine gun never stopped firing because they're seeing two machine gun teams firing. So it maintains that overall high high volume of fire. It also has the cute effect of making it sound like your machine guns are talking to each other. I wonder what those M240s are saying to one another. Oh, let's listen in. Did you see me blast that guy? Yeah, that was sick, Carl. It sounds easy, but it takes a well-trained machine gun team and their assistant gunners to get this effect to work. It also takes a good squad leader who's trained specifically in how to manage machine gun teams in order to leverage this weapon's power correctly. NATO's strategy relies on a high level of training of their soldiers. Understanding how to use the 240 correctly allows for suppressing and controlling large target areas. If a machine gunner fails to understand or apply these ideas, then it will greatly reduce their effect effectiveness. The machine gun simply becomes a large and clumsy weapon that is only capable of engaging a single point target if they don't know how to use it. Which brings us to our next section. What are the different types of machine gun fire that you need to know about? A well-trained M240 squad leader is charged with understanding how to set up fields of fire and they need to understand where to set up in positions of overwatch. They will do this by using large distinguishing landmarks to visually identify your limits of fire. This way you can easily with one glance tell where you should be scanning in your sector. For example, you would say, hey PFC Carl, you're responsible for enemy targets between that blue 2004 Toyota Camry and that burned out building. In NATO, each M240 machine gun teams becomes intimately aware of the many different patterns of fire which each have a unique effect on target and can be very useful in different situations. Being effective with this gun is a lot more difficult and complicated than a rifleman's position. Some of the most common and important types of fire include the cone of fire, which is a type of shooting that is created when you shoot a circular pattern with bursts. When soldiers train, they often make the mistake of thinking about the enemy targets in two dimensions because you're shooting at two-dimensional paper. On the actual battlefield in a war zone, the enemy has depth to their position. This is why senior soldiers are supposed to be behind these weapons because they require more experience and discipline. The beaten zone, this is another really important machine gun concept to understand. It describes the area where a bullet will land after hitting a standing enemy in the head and then as it drops where it will hit a standing enemy in the feet. Anyone standing in the beaten zone 
will be hit somewhere between head to foot. That's the idea of the concept. Each machine gun has a different bullet path and different size for the beaten zone. So in World War II, even though the Australian Bren machine guns had lower rate of fire, their beaten zone was much more narrow, which helped them win their machine gun duels against the German army in some instances. But one of the most important concepts for NATO's M240 machine gunners to understand is enfilade and defilade fire. Because once you grasp this idea, you're more than doubling your effectiveness as a machine gunner. The enemy position is in enfilade so long as you can fire along its longest axis. Another way of thinking about that is flanking fire where a machine gun team can fire along the formation of the enemy. So an enemy trench is enfiladed if you can fire down the length of the entire trench. A column of marching enemy troops is enfiladed if you can fire from the front or rear so that the projectiles travel the entire length of the column. A rank or line of advancing troops is enfiladed if fired on from the side flanking position. The M240 is best used when it's placed in positions that understand this concept. You can really waste your machine gunner if they're focused on one single point target. That's why it's so important to understand some of these machine gun concepts and why NATO groups machine guns into specific squads squads, and platoons. If a machine gun team is in defilade, it means they're using cover capable of stopping incoming rounds. Mastering enfilade and defilade is key to NATO machine gun teams. When the squad leader calls for continuous grazing fire, this has the effect of creating a sort of wall of bullets that's nearly impossible to pass. The gunner makes sure that the bullet is never more than one meter high from the ground level. Plunging fire happens when the weapon is shot at a long range from high to low ground. This can happen when firing into terrain that quickly rises or is uneven terrain. NATO troops often place the M240 in an overwatch position. If your platoon is conducting a raid on an objective, the weapon squad, machine gun teams, will wait outside in a high up position that has a good view of the battlefield so they can pick off anyone that's trying to run out the back of the building. Again, the main concept with this weapon is that it's used in a specific role and has a specific job on the battlefield. It's not simply tossed in with all the other riflemen. If an M240 gunner is being used in the same way or interchangeably with a rifleman, then you're doing something very wrong. The M240 by the book uses another pattern of fire called searching fire, which is mainly meant to attack large area targets. The gunner distributes fire in depth by making changes in elevation in between bursts. Gunners employ searching fire against a deep target or target that has depth but minimal width. So the best pattern of bullets requires changes in only the elevation of the gun. When I was in the military in 2008, most of these M240 Bravos didn't have any kind of scope or optic on them. Sometimes you'd see them with a C79, which is this 3.4 times magnification scope. But since then, a lot has changed. NATO relies heavily on scopes now to make one gunner as effective as two. The Trigagon ACOG, six times optic, accomplishes this, but it goes for like $3,000. The reason it's so important though is because if you've ever tried to spot a person at the maximum effective range of a machine gun, 800 meters, it's really hard to see someone with your naked eye at that distance. So even though your gun can fire that far, without a scope, it really doesn't mean much. So a lot of times you can't determine which weapon is better simply by comparing the stats on paper because that type of analysis, it completely ignores the massive effect that training and doctrine have on the battle. The most recent version of the weapon is the M240 Lima variant, which has the main goal of being designed to reduce the size and weight of the overall weapon system. It's now five and a half pounds lighter, which is an 18% weight savings thanks to the body being replaced by titanium. And it was given an adjustable buttstock, which can make the overall length of the weapon shorter. The barrel was also reduced in size. It can be tempting to wanna make this weapon as light as possible, but if you do that, you you start to run into problems with reliability or the weapon will overheat quickly, which would be a major problem for NATO's doctrine that we outlined earlier. When looking at the Russian and the Chinese machine gun, when you look at the PKM, it's, it's tempting to look at those stats and to think that they're that weapon is better because it's lighter and arguably it has better range and ballistics. It's true that the PKM is an excellent battle proven design, sure, but I believe NATO's doctrine of treating the machine gun as a support weapon is a better strategy than dumping a bunch of PKMs into a platoon and treating them just like another rifleman who is pointed in the direction of the enemy. NATO's M240 machine gun teams always have a specific purpose on the battlefield, which is to achieve fire superiority through their different types of fire. We really only scratch 
scratch the surface of these techniques in this video. And if you're more interested in some more machine gun theory, please like this video so I know to make more like it. There are definitely solid arguments against what I'm saying, and maybe I missed something important in my analysis, so please let me know if that's the case in the comment section, and I'll try to respond to everyone there. For possible replacements, the MG68 by SIG is a possible replacement for the M240, since the 6.8 has similar ballistics. The biggest potential upside to this new weapon would be that it would only weigh 12 pounds, and it has lower felt recoil. We simply do not know the accuracy data, and we don't know how long the MG68 could be fired before overheating, so it's difficult to say if this weapon would be a better replacement. But what I do know for sure is that if the Army went with one of these replacements like the MG68, it would definitely mean a major change in strategy for how these machine gunners operate. I want to know about your experience with the M240. Let me know if you love it, you hate it, in the comment section below. I especially want to know if you were one of those fellow weirdos who got stuck in the machine gun squad like I did. I'm your regular infantryman Chris Cappy with Task and Purpose. Thanks for watching.